Father. I need grace to deliver this message. I need you to give me everything that is needed to speak truth in a world that loves lies. Father, I ask for your anointing. I ask that Jesus would clearly be seen to every heart and to every mind that is present. Lord, that wherever there would be a a rock that would cause us to stumble, if it is not you that is that rock, if it is a distraction of any other kind, I pray that it would be removed right now. If it be you, that's fine. Lord Jesus, may we encounter you today and may we wrestle with the realities of our King and what our King is asking of us. For your glory, honor, and praise, Lord. Amen. Since I'm not exactly sure how to share this, I wrote it down. And so I'm going to read it to you. I know that there are some of you out there that think you know everything about Eric Ludi. For instance, maybe you've read all my books. Maybe you've spent a semester or more with me at Ellerslie up close and personal. Maybe you've listened to all my sermons. In other words, you think you've probably heard all my stories. But there is yet one story that I have never told until right now. This is sort of the staff birthday celebration that never had a chance to happen. Because there is one guy out there that seemed born to work alongside Leslie and I in the startup of Ellerslie, a literal Reese Howells in the modern day. His name was Evan, and the reason I say was is because Evan is no longer alive. And for reasons of privacy, I'm going to purposely avoid saying his last name. But I think it's safe to say that Evan and I, while he lived, were like Jonathan and David, inseparable blood brothers. His middle name was William. We used to joke, in honor of William Wallace, although it was actually in honor of his deadbeat father, whom he never knew nor ever even saw a picture of. But since his last name started with the letter L, that made his initials EWL, the same as mine. And it's a thousand things like that that bonded us. Same initials, same passion for Canadian bacon and pineapple pizza, Same odd sense of humor, same mutual fondness for just kicking the soccer ball around in the park, same magnetic pull toward the prayer closet, same prepossessing affinity for truth, the same love for all things noble, honorable, manly, and pure, and even things as bizarre as a love for Bernie's Mountain Dogs, A&W Root Beer, and full agreement on the fact that John Elway was a better quarterback than both Dan Marino and Joe Montana. Evan and I made each other feel somewhat normal in our outrageous, and I have outrageous in quotes, commitment to the person of Jesus Christ. After all, our personal commitment couldn't be totally absurd, could it? If there's this other guy out there on planet Earth that agrees with Paul that to die is gain, to actually turn the other cheek is right, and that we actually should be exceeding glad when false things are said about us because of our love for Christ. I remember the first time I ever saw Evan, He was on his face before God, just weeping. I had just arrived at a missionary school down in Texas, and I was a few days early for classes and was just tooling around the campus getting the lay of the land. There he was, in the dark, hidden in the back corner of the otherwise empty library, on the floor, on his face, bent over like Elijah, praying on top of Mount Carmel for the rain to return to Israel. He seemed to be in agony, and it seemed the agony in his soul was going to kill him. I didn't know what to do when I first saw him. He didn't know I was there. I felt ashamed to be watching, but was utterly intrigued to actually see inside the inside workings of a prayer closet, and to see a man, in this case an inordinately young man, wrestling with God. Part of me wanted to remain there and stare, but my sense of embarrassment overtook me and I tiptoed out the way I came in. Evan had a supernatural burden implanted within his soul for the withering church here in America. It was an ache that we both shared, but it seemed even more acute within his spirit. And there were many times in the early morning hours that the two of us slipped out of the crowded dorms and found our respective places on campus to do our praying. I in the classroom, he in the library. And as I got to know him over the following months, had the privilege of praying with him, of hearing his groaning, of witnessing his ardent praying, 
I remember thinking, so this is what John Prane Hyde was like. I'd read about John Hyde, but suddenly I met him. And suddenly John Hyde's exploits became more real to me, more within reach, thanks to Evan. I'd read about C.T. Studd, and suddenly I met a man with a like growl for God's glory. I had read about George Mueller, and now suddenly I was convicted by a man who had committed to live out a similar commitment of radical faith, and Mueller-like givenness took on an entirely new shade of plausibility. To be honest, it would be much easier for me not to bring up Evan this morning. The remembrance of his life, though it carries with it the shades of heaven, also carries in its bosom a haunting reminiscence of a brutal murdering of innocent life. So I've trembled throughout this week over the thought of remembering Evan. My reason for bringing Evan up this morning is simply because I don't want to ever forget the significance of his life. I want to remember him. And there is part of me that still refuses to accept the fact that he's gone. Because I'm 100% emphatically convinced that it was not Evan's time to go. His death was not a martyr's death, it was an untimely death. He had a calling, a heavenly commission. And I feel the church of Jesus Christ and thusly the world was robbed of one of the most significant men of our time. It's the equivalent of scrubbing Hudson Taylor from the history books, William Carey from the pages of time, George Washington from the annals of early American history, William Wallace from the Scottish fight for liberty, or William Wilberforce from the battle for the abolishment of the slave trade. Where might we be if Evan's life had not been so brutally cut short? I thought during our staff gathering this past Friday night, he should be here right now. He'd always shared in this vision, even 17 years ago when it all began. He'd be sitting there next to Ben Zorns, chewing on a handful of Sandy's almonds. His eyes would be closed in classic Evan style. He would always do that when he was pondering something he liked. And a contented grin would fill his face as we all bantered on about Sandy's cell phone taking a dip in a bucket of salt water earlier that day. I thought, Evan would be happy here. And we would be happy to have such a man in our midst. We could use his spiritual leadership, his dauntless faith, faith and his ability to laugh, and I mean really laugh, at the enemy's defeat. The church of Jesus Christ needs to see such a man of suffering, such a man of prayer, such a man of faith, such a man of manly unction, such a man of honor and purity. So since no one else on earth, including Evan's parents, brothers, sisters, and extended relatives are remembering the life of Evan William today, on what next Saturday, January 22nd, would be his 38th birthday. I say, let us, the church, remember him. You see, 38 years ago this week, a law was passed by the Supreme Court here in America that gave Evan Williams' parents the right to terminate his life while he was still not yet born. And thusly, 38 years ago, Evan Williams was brutally killed with a doctor's scalpel, and his supremely important life was snuffed out before it ever had an opportunity to really begin. And thusly, I lost a dear friend, and so did you. The Church of Jesus Christ lost, lost its modern-day John Hyde. They lost a leader with the manly growl of C.T. Studd. They lost their modern-day George Mueller. I realize that 38 years have now passed under the bridge, and I should accept the fact that Evan is gone. I realize that I should probably just move on and let the issue rest. But there is a problem. And that is, Evan is not the only one that doctor's scalpel killed 38 years ago. In fact, this next week, that very same scalpel is scheduled to wipe out another 23,000 lives just like his. Church of Jesus Christ, let us not forget Evan William. And let us not stand by idly and let the enemy continue this holocaust. I am not a political man. I don't use my position to twist arms politically. I do not have a political ambition. I do not have a political agenda. I have a spiritual agenda, and I want to see Jesus Christ gain his due. And as a man of God, I am responsible when I see someone weak and vulnerable to bear my chest and to risk my blood and my body to preserve them. That's the model of Jesus Christ. And without him bearing his body, without him taking those bruises, 
Without him shedding his blood, none of us in this room have a chance. But there are those that do not have a voice to even scream out. And we as the church do not have ears tuned to it. And the reason is, is because it's been politicized in our generation. This is a spiritual issue first and foremost and not a political one. I do not have political ends in what I'm about to talk with you about today. I honestly, even though I know that there are better men for office than others, that is not my goal and it is not an attempt to sway you in one direction politically. I have an interest in the church of Jesus Christ being the church of Jesus Christ. It's interesting, if we start talking about orphans, no one has a problem because it's not a political issue here in America. Let's help them, let's do what we need to. Adoption, absolutely, I think it's a good thing to do. That's a good hearted thing. Helping an unborn life is charged with politics and therefore we as the body of Christ distance ourselves. it is politically incorrect to take a stand on this issue, and I say we remove this ridiculous veil that stands in the way. This is life, everyone knows it is life. When the cattle cars of Jews were being carted off to the concentration camps, and they were passing by that one church in Germany, and they were reaching out through the slats, screaming, saying, help us! The church turned up the pipe organ's volume to drown out the sound. And I submit that that is precisely what we are doing today in regards to this issue. Because if we face this issue straight on, we have problems. You know how many people in this room are personally connected with this theme? One way or the other. There's some of you that probably have gone through abortions in your past. There are those of you that are very closely associated with it in some manner. And as a result, pain constrains us or constricts us from facing this issue straight on. But the only thing that sets men and women free on planet Earth is truth. Truth is the elixir. And if we don't bring truth to bear upon the church of Jesus Christ today, 23,000 more children, babies, die this next week, 1.2 million a year. This is such an astounding number. And we, if we were to measure each of ourselves on this particular issue, the level of involvement, the level of commitment, the care that we even have, we don't even shudder over the issue. We have lost our heart that is supposed to be beating with God's heart. The Auschwitz within. Father, for those of us that are struggling to know how to face what we're about to talk about, I pray that you would give a special grace and a special calm for your truth is a safe place. It's a place of freedom, it's a place of hope, it's a place of life, it's a place of love. So Lord Jesus, invite us into that safe place right now. And though we feel conviction, and though we feel the weight of the grief that is associated with this topic, I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would not harden ourselves to it. But we would allow truth to reign in our midst, in our lives, in our hearts, and in the church of Jesus Christ. And thusly, Lord Jesus, we pray, in this world around us. Amen. <clears throat> the Auschwitz within. Those of you that don't know what that title means, um, I don't think I'm going to take the time to explain it. I'll just let uh, you do a little research on history and then uh, come to a conclusion of what this title means means, but it's, it's a title that captures what I would say is an accurate portrayal of what's taking place. It's just the one place we would expect safety to be would be in a woman's womb, a mother. 
there is one person on earth you could always know would come to your aid and would protect you, who would be a mother. So the great ironic twist in how the enemy has debased our culture is evidenced in this issue. The two opposing missions, as we see in John 10, I am the door, says Jesus. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. So we see two missions. We see the mission of a thief, one known as a thief in scripture. In the context of this in scripture, we, we know who he's talking about. He's talking about the enemy of our souls. His name is Satan. And Satan is described by Jesus Christ himself as a thief who has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And God clarifies his agenda. He has a mission and it is never altered. God doesn't have a mission for one generation and then shift it for the next generation. God is not pro-choice. The term that we have used in our culture to define the right of privacy and the right for a woman to do with her body what she wants is in direct defiance to the gospel of Jesus Christ, which says you are bought with a price. Your body is no longer your own. It belongs to him, the creator, and he has a mission for your body. You find out what that mission is and you'll know what to do with your body. And if there is life within your body, I guarantee you, your God is not going to snuff it out. The thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus comes that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Satan, you know, his name actually means, by definition, it'd be the contrary one, the adversary, the enemy, the accuser. It's the one at odds. It's the one at enmity with something. Satan, as a name itself, it used to be just a description of who this enemy was. He is the one opposed. He is the one hell-bent, no pun intended, on destroying everything God has planned for life. He is a snuffer of life. He is a destroyer of life. That's his very name. That is his mission, to destroy it. It's from the verb, Satan, which means to lie in wait. As a crouching tiger, when he sees the weak wildebeest coming through, he jumps out, pounces upon the vulnerable, and kills them for his own satisfaction. That is our enemy. Let's make it very clear that is not our God. A lot of Christians have a misunderstanding of the nature of their God. Where they get it, you know, it's a thousand little things that happen in life. But I am going to go through a definition of our God, and he has never altered, he has never changed, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, as it says in Scripture. In him is no shadow of variation. No shadow of turning. He never alters. So when you get a clear understanding of who our God is, guess what? He'll always remain that way. Every morning when you wake up, your world around you could be falling apart, but your God has not altered. Who is this God? Who is this God? Is he a murderer? Is he a thief? Is he a destroyer? Is that who our God is? Who is he? This is Satan. The thief, the father of lies, the murderer, the devourer, the deceiver, the tempter, the destroyer, the accuser, the enemy, the adversary, the devil. Jesus, God in the flesh, the resurrection and the life, the mighty man of salvation. Let's look at a quick list. Now, I've given you a massive list of Jesus' names all throughout the Bible, and it takes me 11 minutes reading fast to go through it. This is not that list. He's the creator of all things. I want you to see the contradistinction between taking life, sabotaging life, murdering life, and what you're going to see in our God. He is the creator. He makes it. 
the upholder, the life. It's actually his name. He that lives, the prince of life, the tree of life, the bread of life, the word of life, the beginning and the ending. He's the savior of the world, the good shepherd that laid down his life, a strength to the needy in distress, the word that was made flesh. He was actually born as a baby, a child born, the intercessor, meaning the one who stands in the gap to protect the weak, faithful and true, the truth, the resurrection, meaning the life bringer, a quickening spirit, a friend that loves at all times, my helper, my healer, my keeper, my feeder, my all in all. Satan is the thief. God is the giver. See a distinction between the two? See a contrast? Satan takes, God gives. Satan is the liar. God is the truth. Satan is the murderer. God is the healer. If you're weak, you go to God and he makes you stronger. You go to the enemy and he takes all the strength you do have remaining and quashes it. Satan is the devourer. God is the upholder. Satan is the deceiver. God is the faithful and true. Satan is the tempter. God is the keeper. Satan is the destroyer. God is the creator. Satan is the accuser. God is the intercessor. Satan is the enemy. God is the friend. Satan is the adversary. God is the savior. This may seem obvious to you, most of us would agree when we see who the enemy is, we say, yes, that's who the enemy is. And we see who God is, we say, that's true. But this is where we miss it. We have in an underlying, undercurrent, subconscious way associated enemy attributes with the nature of our pure and faultless, holy, holy, holy God. And I say, let's clear the air. God is not a thief. God is not a liar. God is not a murderer. God is not a devourer. God is not a deceiver. God is not a tempter. God is not a destroyer. God is not an accuser. God is not our enemy. God is not our adversary. It says in the model prayer that Jesus trained his disciples in, one of the lines is, you know, when he's teaching them how to pray, thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is heaven like? Heaven, the place where God dwells, his presence. In God's presence, there is not even need for sun or moon because he is the light. There is no darkness in him, none. No shadow in God. He is the same and he, without excuse, without equivocation, without stuttering, says this is who I am, test me. Test me, I've never altered. He's eternal, he's always been this way. How is it in heaven, in God's presence? It's very different than it is down here. Because this isn't heaven. Many of us could say this is hell on earth. This is a place where men and women aren't as they ought to be. It's strange down here, we have an idea of what we should live like, how people should be, and yet we all fail. We have this weird sense about it too. We shouldn't be like this. We shouldn't be animals. We should be more noble than this. And yet here we maintain an animal mentality and behavior. We cannot get out of it, which is what sets us up for the gospel. Because we are right. We aren't as we ought to be. And Jesus has come to change that to alter humanity so that we can be as we ought to be, which ironically means our bodies being overtaken by God and being the possession of God Almighty. He comes in, he takes this body, he makes these hands his hands, these eyes his eyes, these mouths his mouth, these hearts beating with his heart beat. And this womb, his womb to bring forth life, to change this earth. We are the house 
of truth, the house of God. As it is in heaven, how is it in heaven? I wanna go through four things. There's a lot of other things about heaven. We're not talking about heaven, I'm asking a simple question. Would God abort in heaven? Hmm, that was a fascinating thought. Would he say, you know what, it's your choice. Is that what he would do in heaven? Because as Christians, if it's not happening in heaven, it's not happening down here. We are bound by the heavenly principle. We live for a higher realm. The glory of Jesus, not for our own comforts, our own security, our own satisfaction. God sponsors conception. He is the author of life. Now I'm gonna back all these things up scripturally just in case you think I'm just gonna whip something out and it's just my opinion. God sponsors conception. He's behind the idea of life. He came up with it. He came up with the notion of life and he is the bringer of life. God brings life unto full ripeness and readiness. God does not abort or miscarry life. The work that God begins, he is also faithful to bring it to completion. So let's go through each one of these. God sponsors conception. He is the author of life. Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb. This isn't an accident. What's taking place within the womb of a woman is not an accident. It is not just a blob of behavioral uh, outcomes. It is something that God forms and shapes. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. Psalm 139, for thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. What's his works? You. Marvelous are thy works. That's us. Us that were formed, we are the work of God. And that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Behind that veil of privacy, God knows. He knows that life. He cares about that life, even though it is shrouded in the secret of a mother's womb. And some people on earth don't even know that that girl was pregnant. God knows. He knows what's behind that veil in the secret place because he's the sponsor of it. He's not the sponsor of the act that led to it when it was out of God's context and inappropriately done out of lust and out of the flesh. But God is the sponsor of life, and he's a protector of life. And he can take everything the enemy means for evil and turn it to a great good within our life. And that includes a little baby that maybe was born in sin. But that baby isn't sin. That baby is fearfully and wonderfully made, and it's a marvelous work. And God delights in that work, and he has a purpose for that work. And he wants to take that work and make it a tribute unto his name. But it was born in sin! Uh-huh. So were all of us. Every single one of us is born out of the seed of sin. We are all warped at a certain level, and God says, mine. He comes to us in our sin, in our place where we're covered in filth and in our blood, and he says, live. That's the message that comes from the throne room of heaven. Live. But I'm unworthy to live. Don't you know my past? I do and I've removed it from you so that now you can live. You are a marvelous work. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being imperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I I am still with thee. God brings life unto full ripeness and readiness. As a matter of principle, I'm gonna say that God, when God has allowed his place in our life, one of his promises to his people is that the life that he begins comes all the way to full ripeness. You know, in a a woman's case, full term is is the language we use. Full term, full ripeness. When fruit is on a tree, do you know that it's premature if you just take it 
You know, when it's halfway formed, it doesn't taste good, it's not right. And it's not useful for its purposes. When you have a baby that is delivered prematurely, its vulnerability unto the powers of death are very high. God brings things to full term. That's the business that he's in. But we have an enemy that wants to sabotage the formation of life unto full term. If any of you are Christians, you understand this. You were born anew. It's called the new birth or being born again. And guess what? The enemy's not too happy about it. And his desire is to not allow this new life that has been born in you to come to full fruition and full ripeness, which is known in Ephesians as the perfect man, the full maturity of God within his saints. Think the enemy's gonna sit by idly and let this happen? The enemy is the murderer. He's the thief. He's the destroyer. He's the one that wants to erode everything that is taking place in your life, and that's the physical life, and that's the spiritual life. This is the enemy's business. So God brings things to full ripeness in Luke. And so it was that while they were there, this is speaking of Mary, the mother of Jesus, the days were accomplished. They were finished. She came to a full term. The days were accomplished. In other spots, I only took a few of these out of Scripture. But it says the fullness of days. It's like there's an amount of days that are supposed to be in that percolation season, that gestation period for a baby. God knows what it is. How would he know? Because he invented it. He created the process. He knows what is necessary for a life to be fully ripened, if you will. So that the fruit of the womb would come forth and it would be right and healthy. God knows how he does things. He made fruit to grow and ripen. And then at a certain point, it literally falls off the branch. I don't know if too many women in here would describe a baby coming out of you as falling off the branch. I know Leslie wouldn't. Uh, when eight days were accomplished for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus. And this is in a series of a few scriptures in Luke. But you see that the days were accomplished, and then Jesus was born. The days were accomplished. Eight days, in fact, God numbered them. Eight days, and then you circumcise the male child. Why? Because the vitamin K is flushing into the body. And so when you're circumcising that, that little boy, that's a good thing to have. It helps clot the blood. And which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, which is 40 days, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. So on the 41st day, he entered the temple of the Lord. The days were accomplished. There was a day, an amount of days that were needed for the formation in the womb. There was an amount of days before the circumcision. There was an amount of days before she was purified and could bring him and present him in the temple of the Lord. Random days? No. God knows what it takes to build and form life in the womb and outside the womb. He's the master of life. He's the creator of life. We should trust him with this. He knows how to do it. We don't. When we inject our own opinion in it, when we say, I want to do it my way, this is my body, our world collapses. There shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in thy land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. Now, I don't know if I changed it in a different spot. The cast their young actually means to miscarry. I think I have a different translation in a different spot. The New King James actually says miscarry because that's what it is. But cast their young. There shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in thy land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. What's it talking about? The number of days needed to form a child within the womb. God will fulfill them. What's the context here? You live in my truth. You walk according to my statutes, the way I prescribe life to be. And guess what? One of the obvious evidences of that is that there will be no barren in the land, there will be no miscarriage in the land, and I will bring your children, whether it's in your cattle and livestock, or whether it's the fruit of your branches, whether it's out of the, the fruit of your fields, I will bring it to full fruition. And we start in the womb of a woman. For thou shalt come to thy grave in a full age, like as a shock of corn cometh in his season. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. Isn't that an interesting statement? We have a number of days on earth that God says this is the number of days, and you will fulfill those days. Who doesn't want you to fulfill those days? 
His name is Satan. And he wants to rob you. He wants to cause an untimely death. Now, the amazing thing about the gospel is the enemy comes at us, those of us that are consecrated Christians, snuffs out our life in an untimely way. And God says, thank you for working into my plan. God will leverage everything the enemy means for evil into a great good for his name's sake. However, let's be clear of who does what. God isn't the snuffer of life, the enemy is. The fact that God can turn what the enemy does into good is a statement of his sovereignty and his amazing power and ability. However, let's remember who does what. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered and she brought forth a son. It wasn't before that. I mean, Elizabeth was in her old age. If there's any likelihood of miscarriage, it would be Elizabeth in the Bible. But guess what? Elizabeth came to her full time and God mentions it. God skips over a lot of things in the Bible, but he mentions this. She came to her full time. It wasn't a premature birth. It was at its perfect time. And she brought forth a son known as John the Baptist. God does not abort or miscarry life. Whew. That's a doozy of a statement Eric's making, and I'm making it so cavalierly, as if it's just so obvious. Leslie miscarried. What was it, about two and a half, three years? Maybe it was four years ago. One of the most difficult things we ever went through in our life. You know what it brought me to? This. I faced it as a man before God, and I said, God, I need you to rule this home, and I need you to rule my body, my wife's body. I need you to, it, to carry out your agenda. I am not going to submit my body, my family, to the work of the enemy. I know the business that you're in, and I submit to that business. I ask that you'd put a shield and a fortress about this home. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. These 20 years I have been with you. This is Jacob speaking. He was, he was there with Laban for 20 years. These 20 years I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried their young. Their, their bull breeds without failure. Their cow calves without miscarriage. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine miscarry their fruit before the time in the fields, saith the Lord of hosts. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Hey, I didn't say it. That's the will of the Father as revealed timeless fashion in the word of God. What does he say about these little ones? That it is not his will that any one of them would perish. What's happening then? Why isn't God doing anything about it? Because they're perishing all over the place at such a marked pace that it's astounding. Why are there 148 million orphans in the world? Why is there 27 million slaves in the world today? We as a church could look back and say, well, God... Exert your will. If that's your will, do something about it. And he says, I'm constrained to work through the hands and the feet and the hearts and the minds and the lips and the lives of my church. And if you do nothing, nothing is being done. If you do nothing, nothing is being done. He is constrained to a pattern, and that is these hands this life, this body is his body, and this is how he does his work on planet Earth. And if Eric Ludy silences that and says, this is my body, I want to do with what I want to do, then we have death and carnage around us, and no one to stand in the gap and bare their chest and say, not on my watch. These are not dying on my watch. Well, Eric, do you know that you'll get yourself killed with that attitude? I know that. Hey, I'm a Christian. Don't you realize that should have been the first thing that someone told you when you became a Christian? Do you realize that if you become a Christian, you could get killed for being a Christian? Yeah, we live in America, which is why we don't understand that. But that's rule number one for true Christianity. You give up your life. My life is no longer my own. It was bought with a price. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
That is the truth of the gospel. Our bodies are given up. And if we don't hand over our bodies to be used to become the mechanism of a rescue on this earth for these vulnerable children, for these enslaved women, for these street kids in Brazil, we cannot complain to the heavenlies that nothing is being done because we are the answer. Not us, but our yieldedness to the power and the might of God working in and through us. One of us, we're in that church back in Germany and we hear the screams of the, the, the Jews that are being hauled away to Auschwitz. One of us, what are we gonna do? We, we, we look at the church turning up the pipe organ, we're disgusted, so we run outside, jump on the tracks, take on a train, do we jump on the side and say, stop? What's one of us going to accomplish? That's the reason we do nothing. I want you to know that even though in the natural, the enemy will mock you and say, you're nothing. You couldn't stop this train. This is a freight train and it's moving forward and your little notions of you know, heroism aren't going to do a thing. Then that train will continue to run. But if you with your little mustard seed of faith, say, my God stops freight trains. I don't know how he does it, but here's a handful of loaves and fishes, God. It's a little measly life known as me. And you stand on those train tracks and you say, I'm not moving. You watch what heaven does. You may die, but you watch what heaven does. He blessed them also so that they are multiplied greatly and suffereth not their cattle to decrease. Look what God is. And the opposite of decreasing, of barrenness, of miscarriage and abortion, look what God is. That our garners may be full, affording all manner of store, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets. That's the prayer that most women don't want to pray over their womb right there. Could you imagine? Thousands. Uh, I, I am joking with that too. But that is our God. He is abundance. He is life abundant. He brings life. So you think about your spiritual life. You've been barren spiritually. God's been starting things in your life and it keeps miscarrying. You've aborted. The plans, God's moving something forward. You know where he's going, but it's getting in the way of your comforts. I don't know that I can go in that direction, God. Whew. <laughs> I know I said that to you a few years ago, but I don't know if I can go in that direction. What, under the banner of privacy? What's, what's your banner? You know, hey, this is my spiritual life. I can do with it what I want. You've aborted God's plan. You've aborted the life that he began. Who aborted it, God? No, it was you. We are participants. It is us that is making a choice in how we relate to the truth of Jesus Christ, the truth of the dying and the vulnerable. What God begins, he brings to completion. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He begins something and he completes it. That is our God. He doesn't start something and then say, you know what, it's not working the way I want. Scrap that. He begins something with the intention of bringing it to completion. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That term will perform it means brings it to completion. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. The Ome Alpha is the first uh, letter in the, the Greek alphabet, omega is the last. Alpha, omega. He's the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. And he saith unto me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is a thirst for the fountain of the water of life freely. Fallen in love with a lie. How do we fall in love with a lie? Because we wouldn't intentionally do that, would we? Would we really want a lie? Do we invite a lie in? 
And do we say, hey, lie, could you roost within me? I'd like a few good lies in me. None of us intentionally go after a lie and, you know, shopping, you know, in a store and like, who? And it says, lie, half price. Well, that's a good deal on a lie. And we stick it in our life. We don't intentionally go after lies. So how come we're falling in love with one here? Well, first, we trifle with sin and meditate upon the forbidden. Remember that tree in the garden? God says, don't touch it. You know, but if you take some time and get a little closer to it, you know, you're not touching it. You're just getting a little nearer to it. Because if you look at that fruit on it, whew, that's a pretty nice looking fruit there. I wonder what it tastes like. It's called trifling with sin. You might not be touching the fruit, but you're getting awfully close to it. You start meditating upon truth, look what happens. As a result, we cease to love the truth. Before, you're over here, you don't even notice the tree, and God says, you know what, you eat of that tree, you die. You go, Thanks, God, for telling me that. I don't want to die. But the further away you get from God and the fire, the heat over here, that, that love for truth and what God's telling you to protect you just sort of dims. You're not intentionally trying to quash it. It just goes out. So as a result, we cease to love the truth. Our love grows cold due to distance from the fire. Next, we begin to love a lie. Instead, this good can be gained only by doing that which is wrong, but the ends will justify the means. Now think about this. This is exactly what the enemy did. So Eve gets a little further away from the fire. She's starting to look at this fruit, and she's like, huh, but didn't God say, I could just see her. She's staring at this luscious fruit, and the serpent's over here, and she's like, yeah, but, but didn't God say that I couldn't eat of it because I, I would die? And Satan's, you know, <laughs> no. What he meant was he doesn't want you to eat of this because then you would be like he is, and you would be a god. So he doesn't want you to realize this. This fruit is actually good for you. Huh. She wants strength. She wants power in her life. She wants beauty in her life. Here's the way to get it. But if you ever have to compromise truth to get those things that you're after, you sacrifice life in the process. Then we are not just found, not, then we are not just fond of the lie, but we now believe the lie. Though I'm doing wrong, I'm accomplishing good. You know how many politicians live under this banner? Yeah, I'm doing something that's ethically wrong, but guess what? Hey, I'm helping our nation. I'm representing my constituency. This is what they're living under. They're called to the truth. They become fond of a lie. Now they actually believe that they're doing good. When in actuality, they're perpetrators of darkness. And consequently, what was once wrong now becomes right. Someone asks you what's right, and you're like, tea to the fruit. That's what I do. And it's really helped me. And what happens? And ultimately, if this course is not repentant of, we will, as a matter of course, become an agent of the lie, helping others to believe as we do and do the same. Remember the course of Eve? You'll see that that course is her course. Particeps criminis means participants in the crime. Listen to this quote. Now, it would seem that to make Satan preeminently the deceiver would make man an innocent victim and thus relax the moral issue. But according to the Bible, man is participus criminus in the process of his own deception. He is deceived only because he ceases to love the truth and comes first to love and then to believe a lie. This really goes to the very bottom of the problem of temptation. Men are not tempted by evil per se, but by a good which can be obtained only at the cost of doing wrong. I need to read that line again. Men are not tempted by evil per se, we're not tempted to go out and kill someone. We're not necessarily tempted to go cheat. We don't we're not necessarily attracted to bad things. We are attracted to the good. The, the fruit is good. That's what we're attracted to. We're not attracted to the death that will come out of it. We're attracted to the fruit. And if it means we have to do something bad to get that good, we justify it, and that is the lie. When you have to do something wrong to get the good, you are not in God's economy. You are in the enemy's scheme. The whole power of sin, at least in its beginnings, consists in the sway of the fundamental falsehood that any good is really attainable by wrongdoing. Does, 
the me, does the ends of saying I'm free, I can continue my education, I've got harassed or you know, hindered with the burden of a baby, is it justified to kill the baby? Let us not forget, God is the giver, God is the truth, God is the healer, God is the upholder, God is the faithful and true. God is the keeper, God is the creator, God is the intercessor, God is the friend, God is the savior. Our God actually cares about what we're talking about, and he cares deeply. The question is, will we as the church come into agreement with his heart? He has always been the sponsor of life. He has always been the protector of life. But what can we say of the church of Jesus Christ today? Is that the description of us? I wanted to finish with a conclusion from what I read at the very beginning of remembering Evan William. I realize that you may not personally feel connected to Evan. His story may not directly touch your heart, and I understand. We as humans naturally don't have an affection and a concern for those that aren't immediately in our circle of friendship or relation. But we as Christians are not supposed to be built on the premise and the power of natural inclination, but on the realities of supernatural regeneration. We as Christians are meant to feel for those we've never met, to care about the suffering, the vulnerable, the lost, simply because our God cares and he overrides our calloused hearts with a heavenly burden. He gives us his heart, his anguish, and his pain. I'm not exactly sure what such a message means to us as the body of Christ. But Christianity without action is dead religion. We must do something. Our generation's Auschwitz is in the wombs of women. It's not cattle cars full of Jews that are crying out today for the church to do something. There are 23,000 little unborn babies who this week are being brought to painful execution. And we are participants, criminals. We are silent participants in such an atrocity if we sit by and do nothing. Dear Lord, show us what must be done.